We're now going to have a really short introduction by the two scholars that we have here. Dr. Milton has brought some books, so many of you that are interested, you'll be able to hold that one for you from upstairs with the refreshments. There are some refreshments still there. Please join us. And Danny is going to start off with the question and answer period. That will be the short introduction. And if you've got uh, questions, please uh, stand up so we can hear you, and he'll answer them. If you've got any questions from any of the three of us, then we'll, uh, either one of us will answer them. I would, before we uh, get into that, like to thank uh, Charles uh, West the Bird, and the Bird Theater for their hospitality and being so easy to work with. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Joe. Uh, Jay, and thank you again for organising this. All you have done, your reputation uh, extends far and wide, and maybe if the message of people like you and the sort of work you do happen in more places with your energy and conviction, um, well, I don't say this lightly, I think the world would be a better place. So it's a real honour to be here to be here with you. Um, well, what can I tell you? I've already said so much. A few things that have happened since the film was completed. Um, the Lithuanian government um, gave state honours and funded the reinterment of the leader of the provisional Lithuanian government uh, from the time in, in 1941 to 41, which gave the order which set up the Kovno ghetto. This is a government today honouring those perpetrators from the past. Uh, it seems unbelievable. And until I went to Lithuania, and went back to Lithuania, back to Lithuania, um, I, would, I wouldn't have seen and heard it myself. I probably wouldn't have believed it. But it happens, it's happening in this context where you can go to the Genocide Museum, the National Genocide Museum, which I did as a tourist when I first went. So that's the story of the film. And I'm going, I'm going, this is all about. Lithuanian suffering under the Soviets, which is the film shows, they obviously did. And there was nothing, three floors. It would make the cinema seem small. Three floors about this non-existent genocide, but not about the actual genocide. But not only that, the museum is honoring the people who did commit the genocide. And I felt like I was in some Orwellian novel. Um, and I wasn't actually initially in this film, just to talk as a, I suppose, a filmmaker, just for a moment. I wasn't really, I wasn't in this film. The film my initially made was about Rachel, who I met when I first went doing a roots tour. I thought I'd go to Lithuania once in my life, and I was very moved by her. You know, she told me things like, um, I have to take drugs every day to cope with being here. So I turned around and sort of said, so why don't you leave? And she said, someone's got to stay here and tell the history. And I wanted to make a film about her, and I spent about three years trying to do that, but if anyone has had the misfortune of trying to make a film, you know how hard it is, and, and I had no interest, and it went away. A couple of years later, I was talking to the BBC about another film, and it was approaching the 17th anniversary of Bunsy, and I told them about my film, which was originally called Rachel of Vilnius, and they said, mm, that sounds interesting, it's got a historical book with the 17th anniversary, why don't you make it? You need to find someone else. It can't just be about one person. Too much for one hour of television. And everyone said, you've got to speak to David. Dobbit, you've got to speak to Dobbit. And I went to see Dobbit, and I thought, he's my man. And cut this trailer. Needless to say, the film didn't take. So I gave up. There was nothing I could do. But in the interim, I'd been spending so much time going back and forth to Lithuania and reading about what was going on. I started to campaign. I thought, all right, well, I won't make the film. But I get a campaign on this issue, and I tried to set up that institute, which never happened. And um, one day I was talking to this very big executive producer in Australia, and she said, so what have you been working on? I said, well, I was the, you know, these are my films, but I'm also doing this. I never made the film, but I'm doing the campaign. And she said, that's the film. The film is about the campaign. Your campaign, and you've got to be in it. Anyway. The thing is now, we made this film about the campaign, and the, camp the film is now a vehicle for the campaign. And you all know the address, defendinghistory.com. If you go on there, you'll see the links to our Facebook page. You'll see the links to our crowdfunding page. You'll see um, the links to the 70 Years Declaration. If 
you share the outrage, stick your name to it, spread the Facebook links, help us keep the website alive and even beyond that. Um, so that's the only really additional thing I can say, but I'm obviously happy to answer uh, any questions. I went on a tour with, like if you're a tourist, you get on a little bus, little bike thing, you get taken around by a nice kid, university student, blah, blah, blah. He's taking me and we stop. We were in the heart of where the Jewish ghetto was, at the end of Jeet Street. And I said to him, and I was, he never made it into the film, we wanted to make a feature film, we never had the money to do it. And I said to him, um, can you tell me, do you know where the Jewish ghetto was? He goes, no, I'm sorry, I've got no idea. And we were right banging it. I went to my grandmother's shuttle, as you know, and there is a board in the center of the village. I mean, it's literally it's two streets and T-junction like that. And there's a board with the history of the shuttle, Dusat, Dusatos. And it goes through it, it says 1500, this happened, 1600, this happened, takes me through the centuries. Then it goes 1900 to 1910, big fire, 1910 to 1920, First World War, 1920 to 1930, whatever it was, famine, something, 1930 to 1940, then it just skips 1940, 1950, and it goes straight from 1950 to 1960. Oh my goodness. And it's like it's removed from the public psyche. And um, this, what you see, those images, it, it is very much, uh, yes, the, the, the founding president, the founding president of independent Lithuania, who we interviewed for the film and then told us he refused to be in it, so we couldn't, we had to withdraw it, has just honoured the National Youth League in Parliament. The National Youth League who participate in marches calling for Lithuania for the Lithuanians. So, um, yes, it is not a fringe concern. Lithuania has just taken over the presidency of the European Union. In their declaration on taking over the presidency of the European Union, which is a rotating thing or it's coming up, they actually spoke about having an impact on making sure that Europe can appropriately commemorate together the two, two genocides. So this is mainstream. Yeah, it's mainstream. Let me uh, add a couple of things to it. One, you just heard Daniel mention Jew Street. That meant Jew Street. So the guy that denied where the ghetto was, was standing on a street that had a street sign in Lithuania, a Z street. The other thing that Danny was referring to is the internment of the provisional government, the guy that put me inside the ghetto, that signed the order, ordered me into the ghetto. Where do you think he escaped to after the liberation of Lithuania by the Soviets. Anybody got an idea? You got it. To the United States. Where do you think the priest that, cut, that was leading the massacre of the Slovakian Kavla Jews at the Dukas Garage ended up? In New Jersey. He ended up as the head of the Lithuanian Aid Society in New Jersey. The Office of Special Investigation of the Justice Department, OSI, deported 127 Nazi criminals from the United States a few years ago. 27 of them were Lithuanians. Not a single one served one day in jail. 
de a pop, amor e a gira. Uh, so maybe Michael might want to say something because he's got a different perspective to me and obviously to Jack. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because that way we have uh, everybody's perspective out here and then that might stimulate more questions. So um, I wrote this book uh, called Never Forget My Soul. And it's a book of reflections on the memories of uh, survivors and children of survivors. I actually wanted to write a book about group therapy originally because I find it so interesting, the clash of personalities in a group. But being a child of a survivor, I was drawn to the theme of survivors. And in this story, I placed two children of survivors in this group and other people that survived the trauma. And what is so interesting is that it was at the end of 2010 that this book came out. And as it was um, being published and uh, released, um, I started looking around for how to connect with people out there, what else is happening. And I came across uh, uh, Professor Ben Moshe's film. Um, and I felt it was just a piece of serendipity. I felt like it was meant to be that we would do something together. And I'm so gratified. I, I met, uh, I met um, Professor Ben Moshe uh, two days ago. We gave each other a big hug because we've been you know, communicating for a year. Um, and it's just uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I just want to say a few thoughts uh, about, about this, um, about the, the, the losses that not only Jewish people experienced, but the world experienced. In fact, when Eisenhower was, uh, was over in Europe and saw the tremendous calamities and um, the, the horrendous state of the people, what happened, what happened, he said, get pictures of it, get testimony, get witnesses. There will be propaganda who will deny, 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 deny this in the future. It is, so those who were there realized this. We need to be vigilant because there was a time right after the war that the world, the world was shocked and horrified and everybody said, we must never forget, it must never happen again. So we, we, we must hold to our memories. But just in regard to memories, I just want to say especially a little bit about Lithuania, um, just so we remember what we're remembering. These were not just some people. Um, you know, they had identities, they had culture, uh, they had thousand-year-old practices, and Lithuania, specifically Vilna, was known as the Jerusalem of Europe, or the second Israel. The reason for that is there were sages and there were yeshiva students studying the Holy Torah, studying the, the, uh, the Talmud and the associated texts full of philosophy and ethical teachings and high spiritual teachings, studying these things day and night that were really luminary to the world. Now, thank goodness that that, that that world of learning and religious devotion has been rebuilt and it is, it is so vital in the world now. But the sort of hit that the Jewish people took, the deprivation of the heart of Judaism in a sense in Lithuania, and, and not to take away from the, the millions that, that were murdered, the one and a half million children that were murdered throughout Europe, but let us just understand that there's a certain element of this, specifically in Lithuania, that we need to honor their memory and honor the leadership that these people gave to the Jewish community. I recently read a little story about uh, one community in Lithuania where there were some Polish Jewish ref refugees uh, on a, a train track, um, just, just sitting there waiting for the next move. Um, and some residents of the town called out to them, Brother Jew, please, please, we need some help, please come with us. And some, some Jews from the train came out to see what the, this guy's problem was. He said, you know, is, there, is someone sick? You know, do you need some help? Some of these Jews were saying to him, he said, no, please, please come with us. We prepared, prepared a feast for you. We have a place for you to rest. We want you to have something to drink. These were the sort of people that were bred in this place. The, the hospitality of the Lithuanian Jews is legendary. Now, now this sort of culture, these sort of values don't just happen. It's my conviction that they grow directly out of that devotion to the Jewish heritage that these people were so much supporting and keeping alive. And so when we remember, we have to say to ourselves, what are we passing on to the next generation? And I, I, I thought about this in many ways of what I wanted to say tonight. And there really is a whole two hour speech that I could give, um, which I won't. Um, but uh, I was thinking about it, how memory has meaning for different categories of people, uh, for the, the survivors, the children of survivors, of the third gen generation. I'm not blessed with four children, and I see how the war means something to them, how it still touches their heart in a different way. But um, my, my daughter is, uh, is playing on the piano this song about, called The Man from Vilna, 
a very heart-wrenching song about, about remembering and about moving on. She's drawn to this song. Why? Because of her heritage, because she knows what her, what her grandma went through. Um, so, you know, it, it affects everybody, and it, it not only affects those who are close, but it affects the non-Jews. Um, you know, what is it? Many non-Jews go, what is this world about? How could there be genocide? They want to do something about it. They want the world to change. I'm sure we don't have just Jews in this audience. But it also affects the anti-Semites. And the anti-Semites hate it because it runs in the face of, for example, the, elder, the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that uh, book that's like 150 years old now, that say that Jews control the world. And well, if there were so many of them who were murdered, how could they control the world? So they have to minimize, they have to distract. They don't like that the Jews get so much sympathy. The anti-Semites or the ultranationalist group who want centralization of power then look at the example of Nazism and say, hey, let's just push this to the side. We don't want people to think about that. That works against our agendas. So everybody's got their own relationship to it. But in terms of memory, we have to remember so we are vigilant that it doesn't happen again. And we have to turn to the next generation. Because now maybe the fourth generation out, uh, I, I relate this to in the pa Passover Seder. We talk about four sons. One that is wise, one that is wicked, one that who uh, is simple and can just say, what is this? And one who does not know how to ask the question. Doesn't know, you know, even to say what this is about. That's the next generation. That they starting to be so removed, we have to communicate to them two things. That this happened, the reality of the history, but not only that, we have to communicate, especially to the Jewish children, what was the culture that, his, that Hitler wanted to destroy. Hitler's principle was we live by the law of nature. And Jews, he said that morality was a blight upon humanity and that, and that we should live by the law of nature, not by morality. And he said the Jew was the one that brought this blight upon humanity. So we have to teach to the next generation, instead of Hitler's way, to follow the, the way of, uh, you know, I, I don't talk just about Judaism, but the Judeo-Christian values of the dignity of man, the rights of each individual, kindness, and rule of law to prevent these things happening. And, and I should say, what's going on in Lithuania, it's, there's this anti-Semitism, but there's a homophobia, there's a general xenophobia. This, on the one hand, it's about the past, yeah? Because the Jews who are in mass graves, they can't speak out. So I guess I sort of feel that obligation. But it's about the future. If we, re if we rewrite the past, how does the future pan out? And in Europe, let's not forget, since this film was made, how much political and economic instability there is in Europe. So, but it's been really hard. It was hard to get anybody interested in making the film. It's been hard to get anybody interested in the cause of the campaign. Why? Where's Lithuania? Is it that Liechtenstein? I'm confused. There's, there are not even any Jews there anyway. But that's all the more reason why. Anyway, enough from us, more questions. Lady in the middle. Um, and we are, I should, and just, when the, the Michael's and the film's DVDs are upstairs, the DVDs are 20 bucks, the money goes to the campaign. So if anyone's interested, it's for a good cause. Um, thank you very much for the film. Uh, I'm glad I found out about it with you. There's only one thing that hit me really hard. Did the ground really move for three days? You know, being in that place is just shocking. And um, the ground moved for three days all over Lithuania. Because sometimes, uh, well, not everybody died. Sometimes the killers didn't think it was worth a bullet. If Hasma Khalil is a little baby, what's it worth a bullet for? Um, and yes, yes. It, it's just like you think it's, 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 not, it's not bad enough that there's a mass grave and everyone was killed there. But the, <laughs> that as well, it just, I mean, yeah, I feel like you feel. And that's the, I think it's the only way to feel. It would be odd if we felt otherwise. The, the Nazi ideology was that Jews were parasites, they were insects. And once you get people that have that perspective, then it really doesn't matter if they're alive or dead. They're in their place, they're going to die eventually. They're not viewed as humans anymore. It's terrifying. 
I'm going to tell you, you've got to tell you one thing, which is, I was in the dos, in the shtetl with Dusar I found a lady, a lady who is trying to get a memorial up, a lady who is trying to preserve the cemetery. And there are these beacons. You know, sometimes there's all this darkness and then there's these beacons and these are the things that give you hope. And I met this lady again and it just didn't work in the story. We, we couldn't make it go long enough to, to feature it here, but I spent the day with this lady. And, you know, forget the hope that Michael and I shared the other day. You know, after a day with this lady, it's incredible. So there are those people and I think they, they're the ones that give you the motivation and inspiration to continue. Um, yeah. Oh, I, uh, I have an interesting question, but it seems to me that you're trying, it seems to me that you're trying to use reason and logic to convince those people of something they already know. You probably shouldn't do that. Wouldn't it be better if you, a more effect, if you could organize some sort of a boycott, just boycott that? Well, your point is taken. The point is definitely taken, but hey, I'm not in Lithuania now, right? I'm here. I'm standing next to a champion of, of Holocaust education in America, um, and, and we we're sharing an evening together. We, um, I referred you before to defendinghistory.com. Um, We've started an international campaign there, 70 years declaration. You're right, I do not expect to change the Lithuanian's mind. So what is it all about? Someone asked me, who was it? Was it you, Olga, you, Michael, someone on the phone? I can't remember, I've spoken to so many people over the last few days. Oh, it's your wife. What's your, obje what's your objective? What's your objective? And I'll tell you what the objective is. It's to let the Lithuanians know they do not have free reign here. That there is somebody, by somebody in that collective sense, who is watching and exposing and revealing and opposing. And they do care. And they do care because I, don't, I can't stop them, but I think it will make them more vigilant, more cautious, less brazen. And I won't change the Lithuanians, but what happens if the Lithuanians succeed in spreading their message throughout Western Europe? Double genocide is not just in Lithuania. There's a story across the Baltics. It's worse in Hungary. And the whole anti-Semitism, anti-democratic movement in Hungary so this is a much, much bigger story. And I won't have I been lobbying. I'm not lobbying in Lithuania. I've been lobbying in Westminster. I've been lobbying in the European Parliament. I've been searching every which way to try and find someone to speak to in Congress. Because it's not going to come from me. Who the hell is Danny ben Moshev from the end of the universe? Right? But if we can get it on the political radar, get organizations, individuals, politicians to do it, then, you know, maybe it will remain confined to Lithuania, and it may even be turned down in Lithuania. But let me tell you, I understand your skepticism. I'll just say that we live in one world more now than ever, and no nation can completely afford to say, I don't care about the opinion of other nations. It is difficult, it's difficult to put the pressure that's needed to make them feel that there's a united front and that certain things won't be tolerated. But Lithuania is looking to the United States. They would not find it convenient if the United States communicates clearly and to them that you cannot act this way, you cannot treat people this way. And, and the rest of Europe uh, will respond to that. They have their other concerns, but we need at least to do at what, at what we can do. Like it says in the Jewish sages, just because we cannot finish the task doesn't mean we're not absolved from the responsibility of beginning it. We begin it, begin it, and hopefully God provides, but we have to try. You know, I tried to get this film screened, if not screened, have a discussion with the State Department up in Washington. Not interested. It's inconvenient. Why is it inconvenient? Firstly, there's only a few thousand Jews in Lithuania anyway, so what's the big deal? Secondly, it's history, right? So we're going to argue history wars. How can everyone be a professor of history? Thirdly, there's some broader geopolitics here. There's Russia, Putin. He's not the nicest guy in the world. Lithuanians don't like the Russians, obvious reasons. There's intelligence to gather. So all these things come into play. So eh, best not make a noise in the State Department. It's an uphill struggle. But, you, you know, 
we just got no choice. We just got no choice but to keep going and hoping that somehow someone will take it on, somehow we'll make some inroads. Lady in the middle. I lived in Germany for a time, short time period, and I was very struck by the German apology for World War II, over and over. And um, very, very upset about it, very sad. And I wonder if the Germans could say, you know, we didn't do that. <laughs> like, that's your own business, Lithuania. We weren't there for that. You, know? you need to own it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Germans have been amazing. And um, the Germans have been. I, I've got an invitation to go and screen at the German Parliament. Right? Um, I don't have the money to go to the German Parliament. I don't have the money to spend. I think I'm here to cry poor. But I'm just telling you there are certain political realities. Yesterday I met someone from a big Jewish organization in Washington and I said, Do me a favor, take this on. Go to the 70 Years Declaration website. It's basic. Why? Because I'm not a big Jewish organization. But you're absolutely right, and there is interest and empathy. Um, a signatory to, to the 70 Years Declaration was a former German foreign minister, vice president of the Bundestag. Absolutely. Um, so, and the Germans have shown that you see, for the Lithuanians, it's even more complex. Because the Lithuanians, not only did they do something, did they do something, they also see themselves as the victims. And here's another layer of the complexity, which is why it becomes hard to persuade to TV stations and state departments because it is so complex. In that public mindset, they see the communists as synonymous with the Jews, Judeo-Bolsheviks, even though Jews were more victims of the Soviets than anybody else. And so, what's going on here? They're saying, well, we may have been involved, some people, blah, 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 in killing the Jews, forget the provisional government, forget the and all that sort of stuff, but some people, but we were the victims of the genocide at the hands of the communists in the public mindset. It's a euphemism for Jews. So they killed us, we killed them, it's a war, bad things happen, we're even, let's move on. Let me give you an example of how this double genocide is manifest. And we had a panel discussion the other night in the screen at George Washington University with a representative of the Lithuanian Embassy, who stood up and openly said, we don't believe in this double genocide. You walk into the Genocide um, Museum, quote unquote, in uh, Lithuania, you walk past the park outside, and it says this was the building where the KGB were based and they tortured everybody. That's true, they're not lying. But it's not saying it was also the headquarters of the SS. It's left out. Um, you go into you, you go into that museum, and there is a plaque in front of you, and it says "Victims of Genocide from 1939 to 1945." <coughs> colon Lithuanians, colon Jews. In the column of Lithuanians, it says Lithuanians two million, Jews two hundred thousand or one hundred ninety-six thousand. And, um, and you look at that and you think, wow, it's bad what's going on here between 1939 and 1945. Two million Lithuanians died? Shh. And a lot of Jews died, but it wasn't as bad as the Lithuanians. But it's not the case. The Lithuanian population grew during the Second World War. And the Lithuanian government has redefined genocide to allow for that, as opposed to the UN definition of genocide, which was enacted after the Second World War and the Holocaust. And those 200, while the Lithuanian population grew, those 200,000 Jews was the physical elimination of an entire community. It doesn't exist anymore because of that 96% of Jews who died, more than any other country in Europe. So there's this double genocide and there's this complete distortion. And anyway, that's a, it's even more, it's different to the German. That's the point I'm trying to make. But yes, I would love to, I had a German parliamentarian said, Danny, please come to Germany for three months. We'll work on it, work on it. You know, like, like I can just get up and go to Germany for three months. Um, but again, we just do what we can. I think there's a hand at the back, but the lights are a bit bright.
I couldn't hear everyone's questions and comments. So I don't know if this was suggested, but I think that this film should be shown on national public television. Because not everybody is here tonight. Well, can I, can I, can I depress you? No, over there, wherever you are. Well, I, I would simply like to say that to congratulate you on what you have accomplished. Margaret Mead said it, and that the Holocaust Museum here in Richmond, the postcard is sold with her, with a quotation from Margaret Mead. Never doubt what a few people can do. They can change the world. And you are to be congratulated for making a beginning. Well, well thank you. Can I, say, can I say this? Which is, here's a challenge then for your community. I want the 70 Years Declaration to be curated and included in every Holocaust Museum and beyond Holocaust Museum in the world. So let's make Richmond's the first place whose museum says we include in our exhibition the 70 Years Declaration. And, 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 and other, museums, other museums will follow, will do the same, the museum will sell the film. Don't you think people will start to take notice? Don't you think the Lithuanians will start to take notice? Um, and I believe they will, and maybe that's all we can do. But let's, that's a clear objective Let's start, let's do it here. Let me tell you one other thing, which is the depressing side of responding to your question. Every single Jewish film festival that I've entered this film into has rejected it. Not just general festivals, Jewish film festivals. And I'm thinking, why? And I'm not the director of these festivals, so I don't know the answer, but I'll give you my thoughts. One is, if you're a festival program director, the box, your KPI, that you're measuring your success on, Bums on seats. A story about denying the Holocaust in Lithuania is just not that really. Even though we had a prime time to broadcast in Australia, rave reviews, um, big old television audience, we're working, we are talking to, to PBS, um, Holocaust documentaries are not in vogue. So my produce, co producers and I came to a conclusion. Okay, it's not going to work like that. And also, in film festivals, they like to have films that are like more, about an hour and a half long, an hour and 20 minutes. And we wanted to do that, we couldn't afford to do that. So we came to a conclusion. You know what? This film is going to have a different life. It may well make it onto PBS, and I hope it does, and there's a possibility. It may not. But we're going to screen it in community settings. We're going to screen it in schools. We're going to screen it in museums. And maybe, in many respects, that's kind of more important. Or it's another way, we find another way. So if there's another museum you know, if there's another organisation you know, I'm meeting in New York with um, Project Witness who do school education. Let them know, refer people to the website, buy the DVD, put it in their programme, there's an educational guide. I'm rambling. I just want to say in that regard that I believe that Holocaust education is in crisis. And the reason is because inherently there's no reason why people would want to hear about this stuff. It's depressing, it's a downer. The reason why it has had so much coverage and so much interest over the 50 years is because it was felt deeply in the heart of so many people. It's not with the heart of the younger generation as much. And so we have to think about that message that they're getting. And the message has to be not just looking out at the past, looking out at how brutal the murders were, looking how horrendous it was, the numbers, all that, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it's not enough. We have to all look inside ourselves and say, what are we standing up for? What do we want to bring forward to the future? That's why I talk about the religious heritage is one thing to think about. But whether it's the religious heritage or specific steps supporting political liberty and causes like honoring um, those in Lithuania, 
those, those who are survivors, that they shouldn't be harassed. But in, in a larger way, we have to give a message to the next generation, not just to feel bad about the past, but what you have to do now, going forward, making the world a better place now, using the lessons from the past to make the world a better place. Otherwise, we're going to lose those audiences, and it will be forgotten. Uh, let's make this the last question. Dr. Milton's books are down here. We have them in the house. Yes. Down to make it more convenient for people. Oh, okay. And you can get those. And then his DVDs are also here. And they are big. They're down. I've got some here. Yeah. So if anybody's interested in a DVD that you want to get for your own use, or to give it to the school that your kids are going to, yeah. so they can have it in their library or for the history teachers, they'll be available here for you. And the last, the last question. Last question. Um, yes, I was wondering, can you target the homeschool conventions or anything at all yet? Because we're homeschoolers, and we like to teach our children the truth. That's why they're here with us tonight. And I know many homeschoolers that would have loved to be here tonight, but we couldn't. We came down from Charlottesville. So the convention is in June. It's a huge convention, and they have them all over the United States. And I know the people there would be more than happy to get your DVDs. I'll have you talk. Okay, I can't hear. I can hear you, but I can't see you. So if you can come up to me afterwards, I'll give you my cards, and we'll be in touch. But you know, like you, I thank you for coming such a long way, um, and for caring and being interested. Um, I've also come a long way. Yeah, it, you know, from Australia to here. Hey drive from Washington, it's almost as long in the traffic um, uh, today. I just won't have jet lag from that. So maybe I will get so long going back. But, um, but what I wanted to say, I've come a long way for this, for the obvious reason I care about it, and you know, Jay took the took initiative and worked with Olga on it. But please, if there's one thing I can say, if I went home and I contact Dobby and I contact my other colleagues and people, and they said, so how was the trip? What happens? And I said, hey, you know, this Holocaust Museum, this organization has taken on the 70 years declaration. It would be worth the jet lag, the slap, the travel, the cost, the everything. So anything you can do to spread that word um, and get that declaration into Holocaust education public consciousness, I think it will move us along. And if I've got DVDs here or they're out in front, and please, anything specific, you can find me. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And for those of you that are not familiar with my Facebook website, uh, call it a website, it's a Facebook. It's J. Ibsen Holocaust Survivor. You will find all the links and pictures from this. There is also the trailer for this video on that uh, we've been playing it for some time and quite a few people have clicked on it and given an idea. Uh, and if you have any questions later on, you can always get in touch with me and I can tie them up to wherever you want to go. And, and since we're talking uh, websites, if you look up uh, my blog, I've been blogging on this for over a year, and some of the subjects that I've been talking about, it's at drmmsolutions.com. We just look for Michael Milgram and you'll find it. Thank you. There's a lady here who wants to say something. <laughs> I was just going to let you know on Jay's page, if just 10 of you share what we post on there about this, all of your friends see it, and then all of their friends see it, and so forth. So your question about getting it on national TV, maybe not immediately, but we can spread it. You know what I mean? Thank you. DVD's 20 bucks.